welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwako and happy Tuesday. It's been raining quite a lot these past couple of days and if you've been on the road, I hope you've been driving safely. And if you've been indoors, I envy you because I've also had to be on the road, um, drive back and forth to the farm and um, just manage everything um, indoors as well as outdoors on the farm. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we've got a lovely guest today and we're talking all about agro-processing, the agro-processing landscape within South Africa. And we've got a thriving entrepreneur, um, Loiso Manga, who is the founder of Ubuntu Extra Virgin Olive oil. But before we get to him, I'm sure you're all quite excited and maybe I've seen him throughout social media posting his famous product. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, please feel free to comment and engage and ask the guest any questions that you may have about his business, his brand, how he started in the industry, etc. And also, um, look out on all our social media pages of our competition, the Sherlock Holmes competitions, where it's all about a riddle, um, following our social media as well as our website to get the clues on this riddle. And every single week we will announce winners um, who have guessed the riddle correctly. So please um, follow our social media pages and um, take part in the competition. It's always great to win lovely prizes at the end of the day. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Loiso. How are you doing, Loiso? Good, good, Jambali. How are you doing? How are your fans doing and the listeners? We got the side. <laughs> Great. It's good to know that you're doing great. I'm sure everybody watching is excited to hear your story. Uh, yes. Tell us about Loiso Manga and how you founded Ubuntu Extra Virgin Olive Oil. So I'm originally from the Eastern Cape in Gramstown. Well, I was born in Utrecht, but uh, I grew up in Gramstown. Um, and I was fortunate enough, uh, my grandmother had um, some livestock and we used to plant a whole lot of variety of cash crops. Um, so, yeah, literally, you know, when I was about nine, eight, um, I used to enjoy coming back from school or boarding school to come and, um, you know, apply some of that uh, sun, sunlight uh, brick on my hands and deliver, <laughs> you know, deliver uh, little lambs, you know, from their mothers, you know, yeah. so it was a joy, you know, and we used to slaughter a lot and we were part of that process, you know, we were never told to go and play TV games, we were always engaged, you know, going to, to whenever I came back from school in Port Elizabeth, I'll, I'll drive my, uh, my mother or my father would drive me to to Grahamstown, which is an hour away. And I used to love just spending the day, you know, being a shepherd boy. And um, fast forward to Cape Town, after I did my undergrad in 2010, I just decided that, you know, stuff corporate. And I made that, that sacrifice to go into something that I was passionate about. And um, I knew the man that I wanted to be. I wanted to be a man of not, not only success, but I wanted to become a man of value. And um, I just felt that the agriculture space just gave me that peace of mind. And um, obviously, you know, with business um, and with being an entrepreneur, growing up as an entrepreneur, you know, you look, look for opportunities. And that's how I met, you know, the olive oil industry. I felt it was a niche market. It was highly dominated by um, our fellow Afrikaans uh, counterparts. No, well, not counterparts, but um, it, it's, it was dominated by uh, English and Afrikaans white farmers, and there were no black participants in it. So I said, let me get into this niche market. It's been hard, but um, after two years of trying to get a farm, I couldn't. And I said to the owner, listen, um, let's, let's, I still believe in my brand. I still believe the benefits of extra virgin olive oil could, mm -hmm. could, could be marketed into the young black professionals who are jogging, you know, wherever you go, Nyanga, Soweto, there are, our people uh, have adopted a healthy lifestyle. So I wanted to speak to that and mm. the benefits of a premium extra virgin olive oil, like I have, um, you know, spoke to that diet. So, yeah. so yeah, how I got into it. Okay. So let's talk about that, those dietary requirements. So yeah. is this like, um, an olive oil that is, for example, has is less processed or less fat. 
you know, any, any healthy nutrients. So just tell us about what is in that product that um, is regarded as healthy. Yeah, so um, the olive oil that I use comes from the farm that um, I've spent the last two years trying to acquire. Um, okay. But because of, you know, land bank, its failings with blended finance, which never, you know, um, reached the ground um, because, you know, when you want or you approach a farmer and you want to work with them and they are also on board to empower, transform or transformation project um, in terms of empowering you, um, you get a land bank or these institutions which are supposed to come in, you know, with the collateral that is needed that we don't have as young and young um, agripreneurs, um, you know, so those are just some of the, the hiccups, but, you know, Immediately when 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 I visited a farm, a wine farm, the, the, the owner had had uh, olive groves and he spoke to me about, you know, the the fact that it reduces your high blood pressure. It's great for people who have type two diabetes because it reduces that. It's great, you know, for your skin. It's great for your hair. You mix it with some some coconut oil. You know, it it, it does wonders for, for it, you know. So immediately when you spoke about those type of benefits, I immediately thought of my uncles, you know, who were struggling from these type 2 diabetes and these high blood pressures that most of our African people struggle from. So I immediately then felt that there was a market that I could speak to. And um, fortunately, my my young generation of uh, young professionals, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that, you know, they, 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 they were the prime market to yeah. say that you know, you take a spoon of olive oil and it reduces your high blood pressure. It reduces your type two diabetes. Um, so prevention is better than cure. And our generation is very health conscious. So, so, it, so, so my primary market was to educate our South Africans because we grew up with fish oil and uh, mm. you know, because at that time, you know, our <laughs> our grandparents had to, there was Mbali, there was Loiso, there was Zingisa, yeah. there was Liabona, and all of these kids are coming and their mothers are, are, are going to get educated somewhere. So you had a, a, a group of people in the household. So the only thing that made economic sense for our people was olive, was, was uh, fish oil, so-called mm. fish oil or, or vegetable oil. But now, you know, our young Black professionals are working at your Allen Grays and working at your old mutuals and working at your F&Bs and they're health conscious. So I, I still believed that and I still do believe that part of the niche market is that and um, it's all about educating and marketing it to that target market. Right. And when did you establish Ubuntu and how long did it take you to firstly come up with the product? So from research and development, firstly understanding that are young black professionals interested in extra virgin olive oil firstly and yeah. uh, how did you come up with the product design mm -hmm. um, and also just sourcing the raw material to process it <laughs> okay okay um so i mean it, it to me it was it was just a, it was just a, a matter Initially, it was just about getting into a niche market because all of us are into livestock, all of us are into selling cabbages. And my entrepreneur um, self was always about high value crops. You know, if you get into agriculture, do your jalapenos, do your, your, your blueberries, do your strawberries. Um, that's what I was about because the world in itself, I could see that everyone was going towards um, a health conscious lifestyle. And, you know, that lifestyle is not going to get out of fashion, eating healthy and being healthy. And I suppose also the COVID experience kind of taught us that one needs to be on top of their health, you know, to, to stay on top of the game, you know, um, and, and not having these underlying uh, thingamabobs. So one of the major things when I initially, um, you know, pioneered the project, I, I had exhausted a full year and a half to two years trying to buy the farm. And when I had given up, 
um, I said to the farm owner, listen, mate, you can see that we are not getting anywhere here. Clearly, there's an agenda in the West, well, in the Western Cape that is trying to stop us from getting this and our institutions weren't helping, um, mm-hmm. government institutions. And I said to him, listen, back me, I back myself. I still believe that I've got something good going here as an entrepreneur and as an agripreneur. Um, give me 500 bottles. And this was December 2019. And I said, listen, mate, give me 500 bottles. And well, he gave me 50 first. Those went like it was it was a piece of pie because also in my conceptualization, after I had realized that there is this young emerging uh, young professionals who are in this healthy lifestyle, I then said, what's in the market? And when I looked in the pews of olive oil, there was nothing that screamed out to you. There was nothing that was in your face because it was always, and this is typical of a product that is owned by an old generation. Because if you go to your olive oil pews at these retail stores, you'll always find it's some granny with a dog, <laughs> it was unappealing, you would miss them. Yeah. So I wanted a bold product that was in your face, that spoke about, you know, South Africa, a sport that was African in its nature. And at that time, we just won the World Cup uh, a few months before. So there was this energy and, you know, the Black Lives Matter campaign was going on. So I wanted something that spoke to us as African people. I wanted a design that was in your face and I developed it um, thanks to, you know, just just dreaming and sleeping and being, you know, in the zone of, you know, letting my people speak to me, my underground gang or, you know, my people. So I literally just scribbled and I knew what I wanted based on what was in the market. And we sold 500 bottles in December 2019, and I said to myself, throughout the country, you know, and this was an ama- this was an amazing achievement given that I did not have a distribution team nor a marketing team. All I did was just post it on Facebook, and my people were just like, listen, Loiso, whatever you are selling, as long as it's Black-owned and you are doing your thing, you are entrepreneuring, you are entering a niche market, chap will follow you. So from then onwards, it was just, you know, just marketing. And when COVID struck, you know, um, uh, it was just a matter of, and, and fortunately for myself, olive oils, extra virgin olive oil still falls under the essential product. So I was able to sell. Obviously, I kept the regulation. So I would deliver to Cape Town. I would sanitize a bottle and I'd say to you, Mbali, um, you in Camps Bay, please Here's a bottle, it's arrived. You can EFT me the payment and um, all you need to do is just wash your hands. So that's how it went and it kicked off from there. And yeah, man, you know, um, I believe we've got something great going. Um, it being the first black owned brand in the country, we want to export, we want to do all these things and we want to drive the African agenda that says support local, support black because the Chinese are supporting their own economies, the French, the Italians. So why can't we push, you know, a, a fellow entrepreneur that's trying to, to do the most? Uh, and it's been going great. You know, you mentioned something so crucial there about how you started. Obviously, it took a year and a half to develop your product. You started with about um, a, a few bottles and then you sold about 500 bottles in 2019. And you did that all by yourself, no just dist- yeah. no marketing, um, et cetera, or no formal marketing com- channels like, yeah. you know, retail, et cetera, just based it purely on social media, that being Facebook. And I'm just thinking of a conversation that I had with another entrepreneur today, and he started his business um, just also two years ago. And he said to me, we don't have a website. We've purely grown from our Instagram and Facebook channel. And yeah. as you're talking, it's starting to make me think that we are literally into a new world of doing things. You know, gone are the times where you have to quickly formula- formulate a-, a company profile and have a website in place. Now yeah. you could just have a product, 
put it on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and market it and let the people sell the product for you. So, wow, congratulations on that. Tell me, um, besides then sending directly to your customers, are there any aspirations to maybe branch out into retail, into restaurants? How has Ubuntu um, grown since 2019? So, so one of our one of our major plans um, is that we we're starting to have the conversation with the guys at the DTI um, because there seems to be a big appetite, um, especially in in Europe, Asia, and China, because of the so-called bilateral or the trade agreements that we have. Um, so that that to me was always a long-term goal, but. I can do that simultaneously with trying to penetrate the local market. And one of the major things that we are doing now is that, you know, um, food lovers market is also encouraging um, small businesses to get stuck in and um, apply to get into their retail store. We are currently talking, we are in talks at the moment with Woolworths. Um, so there are these potential um, 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 retail stores that are out there. We have had great success with the guys at spas because they've got um, discretion to, the, the, the spa managers have got a discretion to make the decision on the spot where they, you know, where they can, where they can say, listen, we'll, we'll order from you. So yeah, we do want to get into retail because that's pushing numbers. And, you know, you know, the marketing strategy is uh, because, you know, if we can get into retail and, and my view has always been, give me a chance, give me a chance to get into your retail space, whether it's pick and pay, Woolworths, checkers to say, Loiso, we are giving you three months. And for me, that's easy because then I can approach a Sia Colisi, um, who I went to, well, he was my junior at, at school. And they, if they can say, listen, we use extra virgin, we use Ubuntu extra virgin olive oil, you know, in, at our household. As so as you can say, I cook for, you know, these people together have got about 10 million supporters on these social media platforms, which are the future, you know? Gone are the days where we are printing out business profiles and we're sending it. Now people are sitting at home. The reality is that the COVID pandemic has made our people to be more active on social media platforms and as entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, we need to be alive to those to those changes and we need to market where the people are. So yeah. I've always maintained that if these retail stores can just give us a space to say, here's Ubuntu extra virgin olive oil, then I can also go approach a Peltusi and say, Peltusi, this is our brand. We don't have money, but we are willing to pay you a certain fee for you just to post about it and, and say, proudly we have our own first black owned olive oil let's back this guy let's you know let's give me a chance to participate but mm -hmm. unfortunately you'll find that you know your pick and pay are giving us lousy excuses of saying no um no so we don't have space uh, for another olive oil the reality is that all of the olive oils that are sitting in their shelf space are from europe they are mediocre olive oils because the guys in portugal and in spain would never bring their best olive oil here. So the Europeans who are bringing and housing their olive oil on the, on the pick and pay shelves are bringing us mediocre olive oil. The olive oil locally that is in their stores is from predominantly white owned olive oil farms. So why can they not make space for the one guy who is trying to get into the market who is black? And the reality is that 94% of our populace, of our population is African, you know? So it, it, it really discourages me when these guys when 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 these guys tell us these when these guys tell us these excuses and they don't want us because we are also in we also want to to re activate the economy we also mm. want to hire people but how do we then grow if we're not given that platform so hopefully you know um we can have the likes of food lovers and um and Woolworths giving us a chance to to fully participate as as entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs yeah all the base all the base with those discussions and you obviously make a very valid point um and besides being black um i think it's all about the fact that um proud South African companies supporting proudly South African companies. Yeah, you know? Lo local is lacquer. 
Yeah, local is lacquer, you know, locally produced. And um, I know from social media that you've, and you've also obviously stated that um, you have sold your products um, through to spa. Have you done a, a case study to see that um, based on your own marketing efforts via Facebook um, and comparison to the sales of the spa franchise or store that you've put your product in, which has turned out to be the best marketing efforts? Do you find that even with your product being at spa, your sales have increased or, um, you know, you still are waiting it out to see um, how, how the product will perform in the next couple, coming months? Yeah, so 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 the 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 spas that we've been fortunate to get into, um, the first one is in Peter Maritzburg, and you'll find that one of one of our challenges was that the spa in Peter Maritzburg that we had identified was uh, a low LSM pro- was a low SL- LSM market, um, and the one in King Williamstown is doing great because at least there are people going there. But you find that you know if we had to be in a spa, for example, in Sea Point or in uh, in Hatfield or in Santon, you know the the numbers move differently based on the the market that's there. So so it does differ from from the type of of, of um, spa that you get into, but mm. you know. One of one of one of our our challenges with the Eastern Cape uh, market is that a lot of people who go there are traditionally people who our fathers, you know, our parents who 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 are who, who are slow into getting into this extra virgin olive oil. What does it looks beautiful? It, it it but you know what does it? So there is a level of education that you know that that goes there. But should you, you then position? Your, your olive oil in a place like Santon or elsewhere where your populace is more uh, health conscious, is younger, you know, the drive goes better. So we've been, we've received more orders from the one in King Williamstown. The one in Peter Marisburg, we gave a lot of stock. I mean, the gentleman there was just, just literally said, I was in Johannesburg doing the, the tour. And he said, listen, Loiso, we'll pay for 200 bottles. They paid before I even got there you know, because of them wanting to support local is lacquer. So they are gradually moving it, but I think they've used some of the, I think now they're in a space where they want to take some of that olive oil and move it into the center of Durban and Umtanga, where, you know, the, there's a higher LSM and people are more keen and are more open into getting um, a premium olive oil. So, so yeah, we, we, we are noticing those trends and we are just learning from them. And of course, you know, we, we want to make calculated uh, partnerships in where um, we, we market it. So yeah, it's, it's been a learning curve, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's been for the best. Yeah, and you know, as a farmer, um, I know that we, we constantly receive so much pressure from funding institutions or financial institutions um, telling us to add more value into our primary product, and that is through processing. So for anyone that maybe has a business similar to yours, uh, maybe is processing sunflowers, you know, there's a whole market of cannabis as well for individuals yeah. that are thinking of processing cannabis thinking of processing vegetables or fruit into, you name it, smoothies, um, sure. fruit juices, etc. What advice would you give to aspirant or soon to be or already existing um, agripreneurs in the processing space based on your learning and your experience? Yeah, based, based on my experience, I, I've always been very clear about it. You know, we need to own the value chain. You know, I think the farmers that are slowly dying a slow death are the farmers that don't care what happens to their product when it leaves their gates. You know, we, we need to. So if you are in the business, if you are in the business of uh, planting or um, growing um you know, your, your, your green peppers, your jalapenos and all of those. Fortunately, well, there, there seems to be a lot of support around the agro-processing because they understand what it means, you know, because you, you, take, you take those, your, those carrots or those, that, that lettuce or those green, yellow, red, yellow peppers and you give it to someone else at such a small price. And all those people are doing is literally washing them, 
chopping them up and putting them into, you know, plastic and whatnot and whatnot. And all it just needs is branding. So there's a huge amount of value in the value add and in the agro processing. So if you are, if you've got more hair, for example, or if you are in beef and livestock and, um, and feedlots, you should always ensure that you've got a butchery there. So that's where you slaughter, you package, you cut, and you do this. And by the time it gets outside of your gate, at least you would have owned, you know, the primary and the secondary. And that's where the money is. You know, I know, I know, I know dairy farmers in the Eastern Cape in the Nanaha Belt, where the guys are doing very well with their jerseys, you know, they sell their milk for a ridiculous price. I mean, they sell for about five rand per liter or something. But when it gets to your pick and pay, the middleman who, who does the processing and all of these things, you'll find that the very same product that you sold for five rand, you, you then buy it for 25 rand at the stores, you know, and, and the gap between that then is the processing element. So we must learn to, to be in the business of agro-processing. If you've got more hair, you've got sheep or goats that, that, that are specialized in hair, wash it, grade it, uh, share it in your own facility, then send it out at least because the value chain is where the cash is at. So I think I, th- I think that that's the future. You know, let's let's yeah. own the value chain. If if you've got an olive farm, press it there, press it there, uh, bottle it there, do the works. Own the value chain is is key, and I think that's where that's where guys are making the money. And I suppose that's also how you just cut down on other operational costs. Is that not correct? So? Correct, right. definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, just invest in it. I mean, I know a couple of in- initiatives or incentives by government that deal specifically with that agro processing, agro processing, value add. I mean, now we're in a process now of talking with a department in in the province. Um, of um, I want to have my own infused olive oil, um, garlic infused, basil infused, lemon infused olive oil, I mean olive oil and truffle infused olive oil. At least that's a value add and people are very uh, open into assisting the value add portion of the business, you know. So you add a variety and you, you diversify from there. So it's key. Agro-processing is the future and we need to get stuck in it. Wow, thank you, Louis. So I was actually going to close off our conversation by, by actually asking where to, where, where, where next for, um, for uh, Ubuntu extra virgin olive oil. And you mentioned that you'd like to diversify, I suppose, having different flavors um, yeah. uh, in your product offering. But where can people find you and um, specifically Ubuntu um, and um, yeah, maybe purchase online? Where yeah. can they find yeah. So to come to your question, um, where to? I still want to. I'm still trying to get funding. I still want to buy the farm. I think ownership is key. To own is everything. To own land where it's it's primarily grown in, you know, is is essential. Um, yeah. So I, I I still I'm still looking for investors to to come on board and um, and I am open to all sorts of deals, equity deals, the works, strategic partnerships, investors, the works. But you can find um, Ubuntu Extra Virgin Olive Oil. I mean I'm on LinkedIn under Ubuntu Extra Virgin Olive Oil. I'm on Instagram Ubuntu underscore Evo. I'm on Twitter Evo at Evo Ubuntu, and we've got a website where you can order. Um, it's got my numbers, so you can call me directly. Um, and the website is uh, www.ubuntuevo. Evo is just an abbreviation for extra virgin olive oil. So it's Ubuntu, Evo, E-V-O-O.com. And you can find me there. You, my number's there. Give me a shot. Wow. Louisa, thank you so much for your time this evening. I truly appreciate it appreciated our conversation and um i have no doubt you'll do great things because like yeah every time i see you, you've got this massive smile and you've brought <laughs> it right in our faces and you just keep reminding us of this phenomenal products that you've um established and congratulations to you i mean having started this business just a shy two years and obviously um 
surviving the global pandemic and still selling and going into more retail stores and making sales and obviously continuing to, continuing to sell via social media. And I know that you have been accepted under the, um, I think it was SAB Entrepreneurship Program. Um, yes, program. program. Yeah. And I, I really hope that you learn a lot throughout that uh, program and you come out much stronger, bigger and better, and that you actually do get the investors that you want because um, we'd like to see your products grow. And I am going to visit your website. And uh, I, I know when I make an order, I'll take a, a screenshot or a, um, yeah, a, a photo and just show you that you know I'm, I'm definitely supporting you. And I'd love to obviously also taste the product itself. So thank you so much. Sure, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you're, you're an inspiration to us all, Bali. Uh, you're doing great in your space also. We highly appreciate your efforts and getting us out there. Um, yeah, man, we, I'm excited to come to Joburg and hopefully we can meet and we can do uh, a young olive oil tasting on me. Um, oh, I'd love I'll, that. I'll, I'll, be so glad, I'll be glad to take you through that. Yes, I'd love that. And I'll hold you on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, this was Loiso Manga, the CEO and founder of Ubuntu Extra Virgin Olive Oil, a premium brand um, that is available on shelves, I think, in spa, in spa stores, um, specifically in the areas that he mentioned. So if you missed our episode or our conversation today, you'll catch it um, right after this um, on uh, YouTube. And you could just follow all his social media handles as well as go directly to his website to make an online purchase. And he did say that he's available. So if you need him to, if you need to contact him directly, he's definitely available. His number's on his website. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. But before I go, I just want to remind you of um, two shows that we have tomorrow, the Private Property Live podcast, brought to you by Zamantunga Kumalo, where they, she discusses all things technical around purchasing properties. Furthermore, we have SD with the first time Home Buyer Show at 8 p.m. tomorrow, SD Klassen. And um, yeah, she, she talks about everything and anything to do with buying your property first time. So the do's and don'ts, mistakes to avoid, et cetera. So I really hope you are enjoying our podcast and um, that we keep you safe and warm throughout this rainy season or this rainy week. However, I will see you on Thursday. Looking forward to it with a new guest. However, for now, take care and good night. The suburbs of Berea and Morningside are built on a natural ridge that overlooks 
the home of the Sharks, the Moses Mabida Stadium, uh, Durban Country Club. It's just got an incredible outlook elevated over the city. Living in Morningside makes so much sense to us because everything is so central. Anything that we choose to do is a couple of kilometers away or a couple of hundred meters away. Restaurants, coffee shops, it's all here on our doorstep. You know, we've got uh, great schools here. Uh, the girls' schools just close by are Maristella and Durban Girls College. And then fantastic boys' schools, uh, Durban Preparatory High School, DPHS, one of the top primary schools in the country, and then Clifton, which now goes all the way to high school. It's so convenient to be in this area where everything is close by. Some of our closest friends stay just across the Amgheni River in Durban North. Durban North is very family orientated with some great schools, some excellent restaurants and some small commercial centres. The promenade along Durban's beachfront, also known as the Golden Mile, got an incredible facelift for the 2010 World Cup and today is used by all of Durban's population. We as a family love the Durban beachfront. If we're not in the water, you'll find us on our bicycles along the promenade. Being a world paddleboard champion, I've traveled to some of the most amazing beaches around the world, but nothing comes close to what we have here in Durban. Durban has great weather and great conditions all year round for surfing and for training and just being in the ocean. And that's why it's known as the warmest place to be. We've lived here our whole lives and there's no place we'd rather be, and this is our neighborhood.